Okay, intimate group. Feel free to move on up now. Come sit in the front row. Come enjoy our conversation. Um, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Timothy Egan. Um, I serve on the Alliance for Community Media Board. Um, and as well, I'm a board member, longtime board member for the Television Academy. Um, the Television Academy is very interested in community media. We see a lot of our um, newer ME entries uh, growth coming from community media stations and school stations tied to students tied to uh, community media stations and the product uh, improvement over the last five, seven years has been tremendous to the po point where community media stations are walking away with Emmy Awards. So um, we feel it's an important organization to sort of understand, promote, talk about. Um, for this panel, um, you know, the challenge is, is creating content when you don't have budget and creating content in a post-pandemic world when people don't want to come into the studio or you potentially have folks that are going to be concerned about going out on location. Um, how do you create more content? Um, so I'm a content creator. That's how I got started in the business. Uh, one of the things I learned early on is when you create content for state agencies, nonprofits, they, they want to get the word out, but they don't have any budget. Um, so I was able to start thinking about getting it out into cities back then, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, cable access channels. Um, they all had, you know, full peg, three, three veins. So they were interested in, oh, education. You have stuff that's about, you know, highway safety, driver safety, uh, environment government you have things that are about how to vote from the secretary of state or you know that kind of content or, or um then the traditional you know public sphere nonprofits or organizations um, that are doing in the community good creating programming so it was maybe a little easier then it's gotten a lot harder i think it's gotten harder because there's so many people making content for different eyeballs, different distribution. So part of this discussion is to talk a little bit about folks that are creating content now and why they're creating it. Um, so I'm happy to have um, Patrick Heltz from the content manager from Media Factory and, and Kate Hepner, um, who oversees scheduling and, and the content curator for CCTV. Um, what I'm gonna do is each of them have a little presentation that they're gonna make. Um, then we'll have a little discussion, and then we're gonna save some time at the end for um, questions and some obligatory videos. So there seems to have been a, a, a problem with the schedule, and that some people think they start at 145, some start, think it starts at two. I know you guys have already started. You may need people coming in at two o'clock. I don't know if you want to hold uh, your pre presentations until two, or just go with what you got going on. Uh, You're moderating. I We're. Know, it seems like. We got so that's seven minutes. We'll wait another minute or two. Um, I apologize for the. No, it's a, the, thanks for clarifying that. Um, well, maybe we'll we'll just sort of keep riding the bus here, and as folks come in, um, maybe maybe we'll wait because it seems like. Is there anything people are we can find is people are super interested in any area? And we can. Right. To tailor it to them. Right. That's That's the time. We're just starting programming, so come on in, make yourself comfortable. We might pause for a minute due to the little scheduling snafu. Um, so maybe we'll. Do this. So um, just those of you in the audience, tell us what channel you're from, just so that we Get to know you a little bit. I'm from Larchmont, Marinette, New York. We have three PEG channels, nonprofit corporation. Okay. Uh, we're in Massachusetts, uh, nonprofit for PEG. Hi. Okay. You? I'm Lichu Plain Access TV, one town north. Okay. Okay, so local and far away. Um, 
Well, yeah, I, want to, I think we should just get going. Sure. We're all ready to go. People can join us. Um, so um, let me call up Patrick Slides here. Um, Patrick, how long have you been the content manager over at Media Factory? I've been the content manager for a year, just over a year now. But before that, I was distribution coordinator, so it was more in the trenches uh, doing scheduling. And I was doing that uh, full time for oh, back to 2019. Before that, I was at Vermont PBS for a year in master control. And then I was actually at regional, uh, RETN, the regional educational television network, which merged to be the media factory I was working part time. So that's my. That's my programming. I'm programming that whole time. Before that, I was doing like videography, you know, uh, freelance and audio and stuff like I'm that. Jim's son. Yes. I worked with freelance with him about 20 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I run into <laughs> many people who've worked <laughs> with him. He's, he's, cool. he's been in that field in Vermont since the early 80s. So it's always nice to run into people. Um, that's how I, that's how I got into my freelance videography <laughs> using his, his no, uh, that's all right it's an intimate group yeah, so no what we'll do is they're each going to make a little presentation and then when we have topics that I'm going to interview them about if you want to join in the conversation please do we don't have to wait I'll leave time for Q&A at the end but I'd rather have it be interactive so Patrick you got a yeah. few things you want to cover so I, I uh, that's my background um, uh, in terms of video stuff and programming and it, uh, Introduce Kate first, or should I just um, go in? Well, if you, yeah, actually, so um, <laughs> good point. Sorry, I'm getting the time thing threw me off. Um, so, Kate, how, how long have you been with CCTV, and a little bit of what did you do in the world in media behind it? Yeah, so uh, I've been with CCTV for just about two and a half years, I believe. I've only been doing curating and programming for less than a year. Um, inherited it from someone who was really, really incredible at it too, so I feel very lucky in that sense. Before, I was mostly doing production, recording city council meetings and whatever else they were sending me on. And before that, I graduated from Champlain College in 2021. So you're fresh into the programming world. Yeah, brand new, pretty much. <laughs> Patrick's got a little experience, and, and I'm 59. That should say everything. <laughs> uh, I imagine that my experience probably pretty, uh, Considering the age of most people in the industry, I feel like I'm still one of the younger people. But yeah, yeah 2017, I guess, is when I started doing that. So if we want to jump into yep. to these slides, I guess, uh, just some background on the station that I'm at probably will help give some context. You know, these are the things that are kind of like working for us or have worked in the past and might help everyone else here as well. Um, but to understand that, we're, we are a public education and government center. Um, so we're doing all three of those. We schedule um, three unique cable channels, each with those identities. We also have a radio station, which has its own identity. Um, and those are, you know, 24-7 channels uh, that need constant scheduling and updating. Uh, so that leads me into what I, what I perceived as sort of the bigger problems for a lot of programmers in the vein of what this talk is about, uh, the ones that I've had to deal quite a lot with, and it's mostly, there's, there's a lot of hours you got to fill, <laughs> right? It's always got to be fresh and interesting to keep people interested, um, and you might not have the most time in the world for your staff to do it. Uh, that's, you know, when I, when programming was a big part of what I was doing, I was doing it like all those channels and like 16 or so hours a week was, and everything else was all the other hours for a full-time job because uh, most of the people who are working for your staff probably are doing something else besides just programming right running the website or managing a radio station or whatever it could be um, and on top of that uh, if you're if you've got a public access channel you may have noticed that they're not getting quite as much traffic as you did maybe before 2020, or maybe not as much as you did in 2000. Uh, I know for ourselves that we've seen a bit of a decline in some use. Uh, so why is that? Maybe TV, uh, cable TV isn't as alluring as it once was. I'll get into it. Uh, ultimately, your problems are like programming can be daunting and we're facing maybe competition from other non-cable uh, platforms. 
And then you just got to keep up. Things keep changing. Uh, media is changing. The way people produce it changes. How can you keep up in that? Uh, so that's kind of what I, what I figured out. These are the big problems that I'm seeing all the time. And the next slide is sort of the goals I had for maybe this talk or just for you programming. Like, what can you, what can you do to keep up, right? Uh, one of the big ones is maybe if your uh, submission rate is down, you still need to fill those channels, uh, you can find supplemental uh, content to fill out your channels. Uh, so uh, there's lots of ways to do this, and we'll, I think that's my next slide, but I'll talk about the other points first. Uh, you want to you be able to fill those up, uh, and you want to be near the same quality as your channel and you don't want to sacrifice quality, and you also don't want to have to shell out a lot of money to do it. I also know that we have usually production teams, in-house production teams on our staff, but they might already be busy doing everything, covering meetings or other community events or just any other thing that they're doing, fee-for-service work, uh, and you as a programmer can't necessarily say, oh, I'd love 30 new programs to fill in a few holes in our programming schedule. Uh, so. There's always that. Um, another goal is to find ways to entice the people who are in your community to give you more content. What will generate more stuff? What will make them want to work with you, want to have it distributed the way that you distribute things? Uh, there's also ideas about rethinking sort of that content pipeline. Is your traditional method that you've maybe had in, instilled for 30 years not quite working anymore? What can you do to kind of update it? And then uh, just new ways to be making those productions. Uh, so now that's kind of the overview of what I think we'll be talking about. And we'll get into the next slide, which has some of those actual ideas. So I feel like um, you know everyone does it a little bit differently. And I think people have hit on different things. What I'd really like to do in this is tell you what What's working? What, are we, what am I doing at the Media Factory? What have people I work with have done that seems to be pretty solid and is yielding results for us? And I imagine that you probably have your own little things that you're doing, those nuggets of ideas that fill in a few hours, that fill in maybe many hours. Um, and I felt that being on this panel, I can give you some leads in terms of what I'm doing, but I'm sure that some people in here have some leads that would be great for me to know about as well. So if you have ideas, I'd actually really love to hear them during this panel before we leave today. Uh, but I broke it down as some, some big categories here. Uh, one, you need supplemental content. Public domain. Public domain is great. Usually you don't have to do anything or maybe not even attribute anybody. I have a few li listed here and ones that I'm regularly using. Archive.org is really great. It's also a minefield. I know everyone wants to try to stay on the right side of the law and copyright law. Um, so it's going to take some dedication to figuring out what is actually in the public domain, what is attributed correctly, uh, what's in the right, uh, what's actually up for grabs and what is not. Um, but I've been able to find a good amount of content in, in that site as well as others. I listed Library of Congress, Wikimedia, they have very similar sources that are usually, if you're, if you're able to uh, you know, broadcast that or cablecast that um, without really any restrictions. I have some examples of, of what we've been doing to try to actually use that, because if you get it, sure, but how do you make that enticing to your public, like to watch the actual viewer base? Um, and it's all about kind of packaging. Sure, I've, I've found you know shorts, educational shorts about like nature or industry. Sometimes they're the ones from like the 50s with the transatlantic accented narrator telling you things. And I feel like you can kind of just drop those in after other educational programming you might have on your channel that seems appropriate. Um, and that works great for filler. Uh, but one thing that I got really interested in a few years ago was trying to do something nice for Halloween. Uh, I like Halloween. I found that a lot of the movies that are in public domain are horror movies. And I started trying to figure out a way that we could kind of make a campaign, have a marketing campaign that generates interest in our channel. And we came up uh, with the haunting hours. We had like an 11 o'clock or midnight slot. We're like, we don't even know what to put in here. 
Uh, but if you can find a couple dozen horror movies that are two hours long, you can find something that will engage an audience and also be at appropriate timing for that audience. Um, as you know, a school board isn't the best thing to play at 11 p.m., but uh, you know maybe the cabinet of Dr. Caligari is. So uh, that's that's something that we that we tapped into, and we kind of extended it past Halloween. I went and found other things that were just of any any genre uh, that I could put into that slot, and that remained a constant slot on our channel that we were promoting for a couple of years. And at this point, I think I still have like 25 or so files on the on our roster that I can drop in when I when I feel like oh you know we could we could use a nice boost in the midnight hours. Um, so that's definitely something that's that's you know kind of a fun one and doesn't take too much effort on your programming staff. Uh, you do the work up front, you figure out what it is, and then you're like okay I found the files, I downloaded them, and then I'm scheduling them out. Uh, there are some great resources out there to help you find them. I mean, you can just go into archive.org and start typing in titles of things you might know about. Uh, but I've I found some through the Public Domain Review, which is a website that kind of does like a digest of all the things that they are doing. It's not all film, it's actually mostly like images and books and things like that. You can always find some good ones there. Another thing that I like is Public Domain Day. So that's the, right at the beginning of the year. I think there's a good site, it's like Duke Law or something, puts out a, like a newsletter about it. Um, but there's, there's some other right stuff going on, but usually it's like 96 years, something drops into the public domain. So if you're into film, we're starting to get into sound, which is great. <laughs> Um, but, but if you like silent films, then uh, it's, a, it's a nice way to do it. And you can package it any way you want. Haunting Hours is what we ended up doing for that, but I also had some other pitches, and just because I have an audience, I'll tell you one of them, which was uh, I wanted to make a like kind of a bumper before it that was an awards show, but the award would be for a category so specific that it could only be the movie that we happen to have and we're about to play. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, somebody would come out very serious. It'd be like a minute long thing, and they'd be like, and here's for the best. German Expressionist 1920s horror film about a somnambulist, and then, then we play it. <laughs> uh, can't be a lot of things. Uh, so you're going to be fun with that, and that, that gives, you, gives you some time filled up. Another big one that I have as my next bullet is news programs. So this might not work for what channel you have, but we have an education channel, and we felt that staying up on current events very much falls into what our mission was with that channel. Um, a lot of news programs you can get for free. You can get them for very cheap. And the really nice thing about it is that you're constantly getting fresh stuff. So I think I went and actually found how many hours of news we're playing on one of our channels. Um, I think we're doing 32 hours of news a week on one of them. Uh, some of that's replays, but like Democracy Now, we'll get a live feed in the morning and then play it out at night. And over time, depending on you know, what, what resources you have, you can pick it up different ways. Right now we're using like an HLS stream going directly into our Playout server, but we've used a satellite edition in the past. We also used to just download it from their website. That one is a free one. Most of these you can just coordinate with that company and they'll hook you up. Uh, we have NHK Tokyo, which we play uh, every twice a day, every weekday, and then for like four hours total over the weekend. Um, we just contacted them, and they ended up sending us uh, like a box <laughs> that we have in our, our tech core, and we just play it right there. It's really reliable, and we can always watch the feed if we want to, and we just plug it in. Um, just another nice, like kind of low cost and replenishing source. So you do a little bit of work up front and then you've got that hour-long block every day for the whole year figured out. Um, it's really nice. Uh, just going down the list, local shows created by your partners or people in your community. So it's going to really depend on where you're located and what kind of relationships you have. But one show that we play every single day is created by the University of Vermont. We have Across the Fence. They play it out on there you know, their network, and we get it the next week. And it's usually people we know are on it, topics that are very interesting, interesting to our community because they're in the same town. Um, and uh, 
think we, we have played a few others over, over the years. We've had a newspaper produced a segment bi-weekly. We'd play that. Um, and we also have Champlain College, which has had some student work where they're doing it on their TV access and then sending it over to us so we can play it out again and get wider distribution. Uh, and then let's just keep going to the list here. We've got national organization licenses. So there's probably a ton out there that you could really find. And you might want to find ones maybe closer to home if you're somewhere that's in a maybe more metropolitan area. But we've had good work with the National Gallery of Art um, where we're getting nice art features that are like maybe half an hour, an hour long. That's good for a nice playlist or some sort of artistic block that you have on your channel. Uh, we do go into a bigger licensing deal with the National Film Board of Canada for us because you can get to the border in like 45 minutes. Um, that one seems to really work with our viewers and we've gone in on that license with uh, Vermont PBS in the past. Um, so it's an opportunity for you to find people who are in your area that might want to go in on some of these things too because uh, it doesn't always have to be just your organization fo footing the bill. Uh, another nice one I have here is uh, your own archive. So what's better than finding fresh content than repurposing or purposefully using not fresh content? Uh, so we have a giant archive. It goes back to the 90s. Uh, and there's a lot of really cool stuff in there and a lot of weird stuff in there. Uh, and that's just as interesting to me. Uh, it makes it more fun for me as a programmer to go and dig it up. Uh, in, in our, you know, we have actually a, a whole streaming channel. It's called Rewind that is just archive content that's at least five plus years old. Uh, with the logo on the, on the side there. Um, but we also feature that as a block that plays. It's a two hour block that we have one night and it's regular, it's always like Tuesday night at nine, we're playing this two hour block of uh, old content and we replay it a few more times throughout the week. So right there we've got like eight hours, which is something that we filmed 20 years ago and we get to reuse it. Uh, it's, those are ones I really like because you get to be more experimental, a little more different on how you're presenting it. And it's also doing the work of promoting another channel that we have on the cable channel. Uh, and the, the last thing here is going to lead into our, our next slide, which is center file sharing. I don't know if it, how many people here are using a, a file sharing across different centers in your area. Are people using that? OK, it looks like a lot of people are. Uh, the Vermont, the next one? yeah, you can go to the next one. So in Vermont, we have the Vermont Media Exchange as part of the, the media exchange through Telview. Um, great, yeah, so that I've, I think there's that, there's um, this Peg Media is one, I think there's a New Hampshire one as well. Uh, yes. the, yeah, there yeah. is a CCM as a statewide server. Nice. So I have this slide here and I figured a lot of people might already be part of this or using it, but this is my time to promote uh, to encourage you to use it even more. <laughs> you can use it even more. Kay and I are both on the uh, committee for the Vermont Statewide Channel, which is, um, we, we have a HD channel through Comcast that plays to everyone who gets Comcast in the state of Vermont. Uh, and that channel is programmed entirely through stuff licensed from VMX. Um, this is kind of a way to, to put a spotlight on, like, you could run a channel just using s supplemental content that's licensed from other media centers in your area. There's, uh, I put some stats on here. You know, I put, I put on the side kind of what it looks like as you see the different, that's just the newest files that were up when I took that screenshot. Um, I just flip through it every day and check for new things and see if it's something that works well for my, my center. Um, but the, the one for VCTV, that statewide channel, I checked in the, uh, looked at the stats. In 2022, there were 1,464 files that were first run played on that channel. Um, and that equals about 50 days of content before it starts even replaying. I also found what my center, which we're one of the largest centers in the state, and we are near the top for how much stuff we're licensing and downloading from there.
Uh, I think that in my tenure as being the person in charge of that, I was a bit more conservative about what I was t pulling down. But we still had, I think it's like 2,000 things I licensed in whatever this window is showing. And I put up another almost, what was that, 850 um, for other people to take. And a lot of those programs are, you know, an hour and a half program or something. Uh, so it's quite a lot of data going up and down. This is my slide to pitch that if you are using it, you can use it a lot more. And you can, uh, you can also do the benefit of getting your content more widely distributed, which is going to lead into uh, another part, uh, which is the next slide, which is encouraging more production from your public. I do have a bullet point of more than just your TV cable. Um, you can use v your distribution through the VMX network or like a statewide channel like we have as another thing to encourage people to submit to your station. Uh, so that's the first part is all supplemental stuff. This is like what your programmer can do with hopefully not too much time without burdening your other staff or your production crew. Uh, this one, this going forward for me is you've got that public. How do you get them actually back into your space? How do you get them giving you things? Because uh, that's what you really want. You'd love to have it be local. Supplemental is what you have to do if the local aspect isn't there. <laughs> but um, or just, I mean, it's 24 7 channels, multiple channels. It's hard to fill that up anyway. Uh, but we have a few things here that I, I want to mention. Um, some of it's in the actual programming that you're doing yourself. If people are seeing that their content is being promoted, it's being shared, it's being curated in a way that makes them feel appreciated and then also makes them feel that the things are really getting out there they're going to respond to that. If they just see it going out into the, the ether, you know, like they're going to, like, why do I even bother? No one can see it. Like, um, so some of the ways you can really do that is through your curated playlists, your promotion that you have on, on television, your marketing, your newsletters, and then featuring it in different collections. Uh, I'm going to get in. This, the next slide has some pictures, but I'll talk about those when we get there. Um, the next one is uh, contests, calls for content. This has, this has mixed results, but I, I think I finally hit a winning formula for this one. Um, you can try to find new ways to encourage people to, to give you things, or people who maybe aren't your usual people. Uh, and we've had a couple instances of trying to actually have like a specific call. I found a lot of people don't know what to do. They're like, I want to make something. I don't know what. I don't have any ideas. I just want to use a camera. I want to learn. I need something to, to do to learn, right? Um, we have uh, a project we do every year called Crowdsourced Vermont, um, where we take an existing feature film, we split up all the scenes, and then ask for teams around the whole state to recreate them in their own unique spin. And then we edit it all together and present it. So this year we're doing Toy Story is the film. Uh, and we have like 35 teams or something each taking a little piece. Uh, this is a way that you can say, hey, here's a thing. We want you to do exactly this. And like, great. We wanted to use a camera anyway. We wanted to be creative. We wanted to make costumes, whatever. Um, and you're able to get that right back to you. Uh, that's a good call for content. Uh, the contest that I said I was excited about before. Um, we just did one called Pause and Play, which is the Media Factory Pet Video Contest. Uh, this one, very exciting, because it fills a lot of our goals, which is we get more content from our producers. We made something that's very low barrier to, to entry. Um, people are already taking videos of their pets all the time. Why aren't they also sharing them with us? There's no like real length requirement. We, I think we asked for ones that were pretty short, but you could, you could have, and we did receive things that were like 10 seconds long. Great. We also had a separate uh, submission process with, usually people have to be members, they have to go through orientation, all sorts of things like that. This one, we're like, hey, anybody, just send us the thing, fill out a form that says we can play it, we'll be happy. Um, just kind of generate interest in it. And uh, the other real benefit from that, besides engaging people and making more content for our channels, is I got to watch a bunch of videos of funny cats, uh, which was maybe the real reason I, I, 
I did it. <laughs> uh, so that's you know, calling for content. You can put out those things. And sometimes it can be as simple as pets. Uh, another nice advantage of that is it gives you an opportunity to, to try to strengthen re relationships in your community. In this case, we said, hey, let's try to get a new partner out of this. And we contacted the Humane Society of Chittenden County, which is the county we're in right now. And it's kind of just down the street from our, our center. Um, and we said, hey, you have a network that's interested in this subject. We're doing a project that we think will interest them. You like pets, we like pets here. Let's try to maybe cross some of those, uh, those uh, relationships, right? Uh, so we were able to use them to promote the contest. We're also putting their information and everything that we're putting out, so we're helping each other. Uh, we kind of formed a new partnership. Ultimately, we had them judge the contest. Um, and it, it kind of, this very programming directed idea turned into a, a new partnership and we're hoping to redo this contest next year and continue that. Um, you should just go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, uh, I, got the, I got the poster to the right that we put out for Pause and Play. We had an internship and we had them design this as part of their thing. Uh, to the left of that is just some screenshots of what we've done on our website, and these would also be kind of duplicated in newsletter items of how we're showing off what our, what our members are doing, whether it's, as in the middle column, sort of very specific uh, content themes, or on the left, it was just a review of the year 2022, and we found like stat, stats on our member superlatives, like who submitted the most content, who made the most reservations at our place, those sorts of things. Um, so we can make people feel like they're, they're, they're appreciated and we want them there and hopefully encourage more as they'll be able to see that we want them there and we want them to, we want their stuff to be seen. Uh, wait a minute. Um, the other things to entice people I had listed on the last slide, but we're mostly all more than TV at this point, right? I don't know how many people uh, are only watching us through cable. Um, I know for myself, I, I, don't, I don't have cable. I'm actually not even in the service area where I could watch our channel anymore. <laughs> I don't even live there. Um, but when I try to find something that we have out or any place really, I'm probably going to the internet. I'm going to uh, OTT platform. We've launched uh, you know, our Roku and Fire TV and Android app and all those sorts of things as another way for people to engage with the content. It's meeting people where they are. Uh, so I found that people, you know, this is anecdotal, but people will come into the space and as time's gone on, I feel heard less and less people say, hey, what time is it playing on the channel? Or I'd love, oh, I'd love to have this scheduled Friday at eight or whatever and say, what time can I send this link out? When will it be posted? Um, so you can leverage that to incentivize people to schedule. I understand that a lot of people, their funding is very much tied to cable subscribers. Um, so that has to be a priority in some respect. But it's doing both, right? You put it on TV, but you can also get it onto your website, onto your OTT platform, onto Facebook. You can live stream. Um, you can go to the next slide. We've got some pictures of just some screenshots of things we're doing. We have a live partner uh, video you know, stream um, working with the Vermont Humanities Council. And we were able to put, embed that link right on their website. So people are, want to work with us because we can distribute it more, uh, more thoroughly than just, we'll have the video up in a few days or whatever. And that's a screenshot of the OTT app just on a phone um, of those collections that are now available. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I had one more note, which I don't actually have much to say about, but this is something I haven't quite figured out yet, but I'm very interested in, which is to turn our partners into more creators. A lot of times they have some event and they have us film it, and I'd love to get the tools into their hands so that they film it and give it to us. <laughs> and that frees up our field producers to do more things. Um, I haven't, we haven't quite figured that one out yet, but. We're working on it. 
and we'll have a little example at the end. I have some, some video examples. Thank you, Patrick. You know, yeah. it, it's not an easy job. You said three channels and a radio station? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of hours. Oh, you're it's constantly so pedaling the bike. It's it's a puzzle, right? Yes, I saw you use the word daunting. You actually <laughs> expressed that. You're you're we're here we're all here for I, you. I'm happy to to be uh, transparent and, and <laughs> that it's sometimes very fun, but sometimes it is just a job you have to get done. And if you can make it faster and better, and sometimes that's just by having more content that lightens the load, right? My my education there was in the programming world when you're making something for. A, a, channel that's acquiring you pay hiring you to make it they say the same thing the meet was in the meeting at the end of the meeting it's got to be on time because there's no such thing as a black hole in the network you don't go hey I want to watch oh the screens black it's got to be on time. so you're it's, it is daunting you're constantly creating creating and creating and then distributing it um, so Kate let me transition these over to you So to start out, I'm going to talk a little bit of, while we still do have these cable channels, uh, the methodology of how we are scheduling them and curating them. So as a little bit of background info, and I'm sure I'm kind of preaching to the choir on this one, but less than 50% of American households have cable right now, and that's from Lightman Research Group. Uh, people are using streaming services, websites like YouTube, social media, Hulu, things like that. Uh, if you look at the numbers, though, people aren't really turning to Hulu Live or YouTube Live, for example they're turning to things that are more algorithm-based. The traditional video playlist format uh, offers users little control, as they would see it, and so they're, they're a little bit out of style right now. The algorithm-based services, uh, they do give more of an illusion of control, you could say. Users click on what they want to watch instead of sitting through a video playlist. But in a sense, it is just an illusion, ultimately. These algorithms are fine-tuned to pinpoint a viewer's taste, opinions, views through data points. And ultimately, the goal is show people more of what they want to see and less of what they don't want to see. Uh, in our world, we don't really have that same financial incentive. Uh, and either way, it wouldn't really be very good for our communities. We are there first for our communities. And the divisiveness that's created by these algorithms wouldn't really do very good for us. In the end, though, we are still competing with these algorithms as long as we do have the cable channels. So what do we do about that? And you can move to the next one. So like I said, it is important to keep in mind that we are operating for our communities. What we want is for community members to come to an informed and nuanced understanding of the issues that they faced, more of a comprehensive overall understanding. Computer algorithms don't really work that way. Uh, computer algorithms are operating for the service deploying them. So they create and thrive on filter bubbles because that makes the service that's deploying them more money. And it's, again, that illusion of choice. Uh, when you're using something like YouTube or Hulu or Netflix, it may feel like the algorithm is operating for you while you're under the spell, but it really is just a means of serving uh, whoever's deploying it to keep you watching and make them more money. So something that we as programmers offer is a conscious element to the flow of content that is sort of lost in those streaming services in YouTube. When we're creating schedules and contact, content blocks for our channels, we're creating context for what happens in our community. So. We're trying to create, amongst our community members, a comprehensive understanding of the issues that they're facing. That leads to, again, countering that divisiveness, greater empathy between parties, and deeper understanding of the problems that are happening, and hopefully an actual actionable solution for them. Um, so I think one of the ways to think about scheduling channels in the age of algorithms is sort of adopting an algorithmic practice of you do want to show viewers content related to what they've recently watched because again we're building context. Uh, you want it to be related but maybe offering a counter viewpoint to what they've recently seen because we do want to work against the algorithmic practice of showing viewers content that will sort of hit the button in their brain, you know? Uh, either showing them something that they already agree with and that kind of feeds them and so they keep watching because they keep on having their view validated or showing them something that makes them so angry that they keep watching, kind of getting into an internet rabbit hole as I'm sure we all have. Uh, we really want to avoid that sort of hitting the button in their brain thing. Number one, because we don't really have the incentive to. Uh, but number two, because if we are operating in service of our communities, we need to understand that that is not something that does it any good. Um, 
Okay, and I'm going to make a big transition into a related, but maybe not the most married topic. Um, I'm going to be talking about capturing content during COVID. It's a big transition. Uh, so basically, I'll go over what Town Meeting TV did. In 2020, when COVID hit, we had to go from recording municipal meetings with like a basic camera, microphones, mixer setup. Uh, and we'd been doing that for ever since the 80s when we first started. After that, we went to recording meetings completely remotely for six months. And then this new hybrid setup was created to uh, accommodate both the Zoom, uh, the Zoom factor in meetings as well as the live factor. So the new hybrid setup is very different from the traditional setup. It includes a computer, oftentimes multiple PTZ cameras, live switching uh, between Zoom scenes and in person, and a live graphics software. And uh, out of curiosity, have your stations, any of your stations adopted any methods like this for recording content? Yeah? Cool. Good, I'm glad to hear it. I was hoping so. Um, so some adopt, I found that some adopt this new way of production kind of easily. For me, I was just coming out of college when I started working at CCTV and the hybrid system was already in place. So I was kind of, after college, learning on that system. And for me, it kind of felt like a natural step up of this uh, sort of, not singular, but a way of recording where it's easy to focus in on one aspect and want to make that you know, really good and uh, going to this more overarching way of production where you, know, you are more in control of the final product as you're recording. Um, so for me, it was like a little bit of a natural, this is where it would go. I think that for a lot of people who have been producing for a really long time, uh, the more traditional way, it can be tedious. Um, they are new systems, so they're sometimes buggy. They don't always work the best, um, but they're getting solved. It's just something that's being pioneered. Um, so I think there, uh, some people adopt it more easily than others. Uh, but the benefit for us as programmers, programmers and curators is live graphics and switching means that we're, late, we're not waiting nearly as long for uh, content to come to us so we can schedule it, put it on our websites, and put it wherever it needs to go. So we are getting information out faster. And if you go to the next slide. So I think that hybrid and remote production is a bit of an unperfected art. Again, it can be a little bit tedious for people. People who are used to the traditional method, have more fun with it, are more uh, in tune with that. So there's not as much uh, excitement about it, I think, sometimes. But there is great potential for it. You do have the potential for co connecting anyone, anywhere, at any time. I think Zoom advertises themselves as that, too. Uh, but in our context, that can be really helpful. Um, these systems, as I was saying, also allow producers to have more control over the final product. So the post-production post is pretty minimal. Um, there's also a potential for experimental live graphics in what we do with mostly municipal meetings um, <laughs> that might not really fit in super well, but I think that for more like artsy, creative things, um, I, I'd love to see people experimenting with that because I think there's, there is a lot of potential there. And again, it also allows us to let the content come to us. So some content is produced entirely hands-free. Um, so as far as whether or not the uh, traditional like, m ways of recording are robust enough for people going forward, it is like a good foundation to have. I think that um, having been trained in that and then making a switch when I did was pretty like beneficial. I have like a pretty comprehensive understanding and people should still be learning that traditional method, I believe. But instead of that being just the way that's done, it can now be a foundation. There's more to expand on, which is really exciting. And again, just to bring it all together, for programmers, uh, these productions really help us serve our communities more efficiently. We don't have to wait for post-production to be done, you know, maybe a little bit, but it's not nearly as long. Um, yeah, and Patrick, you were saying something in your presentation about uh, sort of having people create the content, these organizations create the content and then bring it to us. Um, and I think that that is also what we should be looking towards at CCTV. I know that we've had a few grants to help um, the Ethan Allen Homestead, which is a museum around here. 
uh, we had a grant to give them their own hybrid system so they can record their own content now and send it to us if they so choose. I think we also did this for the Richard Kemp Center, which is another nonprofit organization in Burlington right down the road from us. And I believe with our municipalities, they actually own the equipment. So if they needed to uh, record something and we weren't available to help produce it, they would be able to do it themselves. We wouldn't need to be there. We might help make it a little bit prettier, but um, we aren't as essential as producers there. And so that is what I have for my presentation. Thank you. Um, I think it was important to sort of hear where they're coming from before we had a conversation because it's not, it's a daunting task and it's really hard to think about how do you collect this content and, and be able to hear from each of them, you know, different ways that they do it, different mechanisms that they do it. Um, one thing I think that uh, I get excited by um, in, in New Hampshire where I live is the amount of young people that are in and around and involved in community media stations, whether the, uh, uh, in New Hampshire we have what they call CTE, uh, Continuing and Tech, uh, Career and Tech Education Centers. And so, so most of those centers actually have a channel within them. Um, so they're creating, they have young people to create programming. Um, maybe the theme of my day to harken back to my other panel, right? We had. BTSU, we had UVM, we had Champlain. There's a lot of students creating content. How have you been able to sort of say to them, hey, aspiring creator, we actually have a distribution platform over here for you. How do you build that relationship? How is that, how, how active are young people in, you know, creating content and helping you program out your channels? Uh, well, actually, we have like a really robust internship program at CCTV, and I think that um, it's advertised through the schools a bit, I believe. Um, and when they come in, they, I believe at least, I think they're making our best content. Um, it's really, you can really feel their interest in the subjects that they're approaching. Um, I don't really know how we would get more people to come to us because I do believe that if more young people knew about public access and everything that we're doing and just how easy it is to have your content distributed, you know, if I was more in tune with this stuff when I was in school, I would be like going to Media Factory, going to Town Meeting TV all the time and submitting my content. I just didn't really have that knowledge. So um, the best I could say is word of mouth, I think. Um, you know, I think especially with young people, that works pretty well. and. Uh, giving our interns a good experience so that they can tell their friends about it and hopefully bring more people right, in. That's word of mouth going back to campus from someone that actually lived it. Patrick, any Yeah, I think, I think people knowing about what you actually have to offer is, is really big. And um, where they're, I guess, coming up short in terms of what they have available to them. Uh, oh, an overarching problem probably for every center is people have a lot of technology themselves now, with their phones or even distribution, like using YouTube, they can make an account pretty easily, and they go, oh, well, why do I ever need a public access center? Um, and, and it's, you know, we have to figure out how to tell them, like, well, our cameras are much better than yours, and we have workshops, we can get a good product, and all this sort of stuff like that. And have it, we actually have an, a following and an audience that, you, instead of your five viewers yes, on your YouTube we can, channel. We can help boost that, we can help each other, right? Um, so I think the younger audience especially, they're like, why would I need that? Whereas maybe an older one is more used to it and understand our value. Um, so lately, you know, we've been trying a lot, uh, trying to really cultivate or foster more of a relationship with these youth groups. Uh, we've had either local high school or we have University of Vermont and Champlain College are very close by. We've had a good relationship with Champlain College for a while. Our director actually helps with their Keystone He's, uh, projects that happen at the end of their uh, uh, their year of video making. Uh, but one thing that we figured out is that some of these clubs or programs that are run at these colleges don't necessarily let their students just take all the equipment they want. Um, it's usually has to be very specific to what they're doing, or it's locked behind like what grade you're in. It's like, oh, well, if you want a camera, you can't take that out until you're a junior or whatever. And it's really locking people out. And we, when I heard that, I was incredibly surprised. I didn't know that. I'm like, do people know that they could leave their freshman class and walk over to our place and take out a camera and just do it today um, and get their projects done? 
Um, so I think it's, it's, you get some people in the door, whether you bring a class in. We've had a couple classes from UVM, from Champlain College, from local high schools. Um, in our doors, we give them a tour, and that plants that seed, and they now know, and then the word of mouth happens from there, where it's either them or some sort of friend. Um, yeah, uh, the only other thing I could mention is like, we, our, our education and outreach department sort of tries to get into a lot of student camps, and that's even younger students, like middle, middle school. Yep. Um, and sometimes we see students who are in that who then create a video out of their project. We sometimes see their parents later, because um, they, they see that there's, there's something we can do here. They have access to gear, they can access, access, hmm? access to the creative process. Um, another place where I think, you know, is a ripe discussion about where content comes from is ooh, the last six years, we've had a very robust political conversation in this country. And there are people that are political activists on any issue and every issue. Um, and community TV is a public forum, and while I think we have to protect democracy, you also sort of have to protect, you know, sometimes folks might air shows that you don't like. Yeah, you know, my rule of thumb is change, you don't like it, change the channel. How has political activism created more content, and how do you balance that? What is that content with some type of integrity or ethics, you know, to air that kind of content? Okay, okay. Um, well, actually, that's kind of a funny question because right now I believe the block that's playing on Town Meeting TV is a. Uh, basically all of our content about something that a lot of um, our community producers and stuff have been thinking about lately has been specifically freedom of speech and our relationship to that and uh, its relationship with hate speech. So the programming block that I have going right now on our main channel is actually all of the freedom of speech related content that's been produced only in like the past few months because it really is a hot topic around. Um, there are some people who are more on the side of you can't limit it like at all or the limitations have to be like very very minuscule like you kind of really have to let people say what they want um, and not censor too much and there's a few people who are more on the side of uh, expanding the definition of hate speech to encompass more um, so we do have content on both sides of that um, you know I it's not only about scheduling that content um, together, but sort of like what I was saying with the algorithms and whether we're, not, whether we're hitting a button in someone's brain or not, right? Uh, instead of having the first half of the block be people who are pro this issue, second half of the block is people who are against this issue, uh, you need to find sort of the common threads. So, for example, I think in one of the earlier programs, I have, uh, one of the guests said something about um, they believe that hate speech should not, I, I don't remember exactly what the argument was, but they believe they were more on the side of uh, hate speech, the definition of that should be expanded to include more. Um, immediately after that, I played something made by a community producer who absolutely does not believe that at all, is like very much on the other side of that. And um, I think that does more good than say, scheduling two people who uh, want to expand the definition of hate speech together. Um, you know, you don't want to be validating someone's viewpoint too much. You kind of want to have them playing mental tennis in a way, hearing one side, hearing the other side, hearing one side, hearing the other side. Uh, and then at the end, the viewer is allowed to make decisions and has been informed or educated or at least aware of what those organizations are about and those issues. Exactly. Um, do you get... Do you get pushback, public complaints, issues when people go, the content's too political, or it's you know, I didn't like that, you know, or do, or do, or people respectful of, well, everybody's entitled to their opinion. I may not have to agree with it, but they have the right to say it. Yeah, I think uh, so. Earlier in March, we had a program that was really controversial in that way, and we did get a lot of pushback about it, um, and. 
something that I suggested, I, I'm not, I don't really receive the pushback, it's more the uh, like channel coordinators who get that feedback, um, but something that I suggested is, you know, people should come in and, in a way, make counter-programming if they disagree with what they're seeing. You know, I think that it's on our website, you know, if you uh, disagree with what you're seeing, come on in and make a show. We want to hear what you have to say. So and you create more programs. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> more programming. It works out for everybody. Um, so that's, that's where my brain went. So we'll, we'll take a question on the floor, and then Patrick will talk to you about that as well. Some years ago, my Access Center was offered a uh, monthly free program from, I think it was the American Nazi Party. And um, it, the question went before the board because the board thought, this is odious stuff, this is hate speech, we don't want it in the community, it's going to raise a lot of hackles, cause a lot of arguments, a lot of negative feedback for our Access Center. So they declined it because there was no local sponsor, no, no local resident would sign a paper saying, yeah, I'd like this to see this. But I agree with your position that you could air it and encourage people to counter-program. I would say too, you know, um in general, if people are going to disagree with something, they have to understand what they're disagreeing with before they see it. So even if the content doesn't align with their views, they now have a deeper understanding of what the other side is saying so they can formulate their own argument better. You know, um, I think that a lot of people will see, and it is because of algorithms, I believe, a lot of people will see content that doesn't align with their views and sort of take it as a they're just so used to having the button hit in their brain that it hits the other button in their brain that's like, this makes me angry, I gotta do something about it. Uh, whereas, you know, a more, uh, I think, a better way of looking at it is, you know, if you're really against something and you see something that you disagree with, how can I take this to help me, you know? Um, I think because it is free programming. That's that is like a that's an intense. Patrick spot. wants to jump in. He's biting his okay, tongue okay, there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, all you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, you know, I talked a lot about supplemental programming and where to find it and everything like that. And this is something that's coming right to your door and, and asking to do it. Um, I think this is where I'd, I'd say, oh, well, my job is to to curate, right? To curate the channel. And I don't think that meets uh, maybe the standards of, of what I want our channel to be. And I understand that it could it could cultivate uh, more discussion and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it might be because I don't agree with it, and maybe that's in the back of my head of why I'm, I'm declining it. But I would, anytime somebody approaches me with any content, the first thing I say to them is, "I'd love for you to have a sponsor locally." Um, and I would say that first to anything, even if it's something that I 100% agree with. Uh, and then sometimes I go, it's really quality content, all sponsored as a member of staff, um, which, is, which is technically how we're entering those programs. When we are getting supplemental content, we are entering it as who's sponsoring this? Staff is sponsoring it. And I don't have to sponsor anything as staff that I don't, if, you know, I don't have to if I don't want to. Um, but I, it, is, it is one of those questions you, tackle, you, you, know, you have to work with. And you know, in our policies, our public access channel, it says you can air hate speech. That's the thing that it says you can do. Um, but I don't necessarily have to invite it if I don't want to. Um, that's kind of just me speaking it personally. Uh, and somebody else might feel differently. Question there. And then so uh, three stations seven years and 3,000 miles ago in a way. Uh, we had a local producer who went through our studio certification program, checked all the boxes. He gets in front of his green screen for a studio show and starts ranting about 9 11 and who was really responsible for that, that sort of stuff. And the three things we did is we had a pretty active public access producer community at that time at that station. It was based at a university, so we have very strict free speech laws, like we have to allow whatever as long as it's not obscene or pornographic or commercial, basically. Uh, but, so we had this advisory committee. When there was inevitably a complaint about this from a local rabbi, uh, it went to that committee to review the complaint, whether it met the standards of incitement to violence. And eventually they upheld that it was allowed to be on there because it was just vague enough, basically. Uh, but the other things we did is I, I could still, as the guy programming the channel, declare that it should be in safe harbor. 
So at least that mm -hmm. pushes it off till after 11 p.m. Great idea. And mm -hmm. I scheduled ADL uh, PSAs, anti-Semitism awareness PSAs, to play after it every day in time show. So at least we could do those three things. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're ultimately the curator, right? right. <laughs> the scheduler, and you know, if you're if it's in your policy to allow that programming, then I don't see a reason to deny it or push it away. But Safe Harbor makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Question. Just can you talk a little bit about content blocks? Because you both sounds like you both use that. Um, is there any data that people stay with you to keep content the same? Like how long are those blocks? And you know, if, if I'm on a government channel and I'm doing a long block that is maybe specific to one town, I don't usually do that because I'm excluding them. That's a, that's a tricky one because there's so many factors in it, right? Um, content block, you know, when I when I say that, it, it can mean different things. We have ones that are more sort of just like, oh, it's it's Wednesday, and Wednesday we we typically play this kind of lecture or whatever, and that that's a content block, and then what follows it will be something similar to that topic, and then some are more specific. It's like hey, we just suddenly got a lot of producers doing content about beer and we put them all in a playlist for an hour. Um, or on our, our public access channel to feature our very short content that we get from people that don't have like a real, starts at an hour block or anything, we have like buy the slice. And it's just like tiny pieces all going together. And that's like a 30, 60, or 90 minute block. And that's content block. Um, but in terms of do we know if people are staying more engaged because we're doing that, it, it's kind of tricky. We don't really get much information from our cable provider. They don't tell us that type of data. If we ask them for it, they will say, these are how many subscribers are in the area. And that's what we have to go off of. <laughs> so we're, we're doing things, you know, it's anecdotally people who give us feedback. And a lot of it is just, well, I know it works for commercial stations, that, that audience flow of um, how do you engage people, and although ours is a, is a bit different type of station, I imagine the same principles apply. I, that's you know that's what, what you assume as a programmer, that the things that have been working for television for its entire run uh, do work, <laughs> like, like having one program that leads into an exit is of similar content. So if you're uh, doing two lectures back to back, you're talking about like a four hour it, it could be, yeah. Um, you know, our, our like prime time is like a four hour period. Um, I'd say rarely is the whole thing considered one thematic block. Because uh, I think as you, your, your kind of view of what programming is gets warped as you program more. <laughs> I'm hyper aware of everything that we're playing and I think things are super repetitive, but I never sit down and watch TV for six hours. I watch TV for an hour, it's like two things and then I leave. But if I do see something that's like, oh, well, that's interesting too, I might stick around for a little bit longer. But if I stick long for longer, it's another half hour, not another four hours or anything like that. I think it'd be crazy to think that people are going to turn on your channel. And as long as you something interesting and related next, they'll not leave. They're going to leave anyway, right? Um, but knowing that, how often do you guys repeat things for? Like a specific program? Like how often do you so we, I think, uh, we promise uh, everybody who we make videos for that they'll get nine plays on the channel. Um, and I'll usually stretch that out over the course of a month, I want to say. Um, does that answer your question? Sorry. Yeah, so I'm usually playing shows for like two weeks. And yeah, maybe they play seven yeah. times week. And and is your nine slots over the month as opposed to chunked within the first couple, first week or two? But it's so it, yeah. It, it's, it's fresh when you see it again, right? It was that great old phrase of the the NBC, right? If it reruns, if you haven't seen it, it's new to you. 
Like, does that give you a little bit of freshness because you build space in? Oh, yeah. And I think that, um, so if you are, if you have a program that maybe touches on something that is wider than just your community, something that touches on a conversation that we're having nationally, that's something that I would stretch out uh, longer than the course of a month, maybe. If I'm like, you know, if it's something about this free speech thing that we're encountering a lot at Town Meeting TV, if I get another free speech program, I will air it within a week of getting it, um, because we always do that. But I may not, you know, whereas something local, like an, a show about a local event that's coming up, um, that will get as many airs as it can before the event happens. That's like a lot more timely. But if it's something like a little more overarching where I can sort of predict, I think we'll have a little bit more free speech content in a month, and then I can create like a really good block out of it, um, I will hold on to it a little bit longer. Well, like a city council meeting. Oh yeah, those are those. Uh, we don't air them anymore after the most recent one. So oh, yeah. if like there was a city council meeting on November first, and then there was one yesterday, like that November first yeah, one would be out of date. Themselves out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But this, how this, many times are you trying to play it in before that happens? Um. So. Uh, actually, the way that we do blocks for municipal meetings is every night at 8 p.m. gets a different municipality. Uh, so we serve Chittenden County. So that includes Burlington, Winooski, Essex, Chittenden County. Um, and so with that, they get three plays every day because that's a repeating block that will play at 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. as well. So uh, that's about three plays in one night. And usually if they last for about two weeks, like maybe like six, possibly nine plays if it's not a super frequent meeting, you know, it depends on how frequently they're recorded. We've got, um, you know, it depends on what, what thing you're doing, but there's that whole equity part of how you schedule, because you have to hit the goals of, you know, making it interesting and having good content, but you have to be equitable when it depends on the towns that you're serving, as well as all your producers. And it depends on, for us, it's a different channel. Like for the government ones, we're guaranteeing every meeting plays six times in the two weeks before usually the next meeting happens. And we're hitting different periods of the day. So it's like, oh, we cover Shelburne and Hinesburg, but Hinesburg isn't always playing at night and Shelburne's always in the morning. It's a giant puzzle to get it. So they're all hitting a certain amount at a certain time of day and none are over the other one. And then also we have live meetings incorporated. So we're not hitting, you know, trying to keep it as equitable as possible. And we're, that one's a very nice, clear-cut freshness thing, right? After a month, that's not going to maybe be relevant anymore, but for something like a, a public access channel, we have in our policy the, the bare minimum of what we guarantee. And people, usually if they have a continuing show, will sign on like, I'm going to do my show every week. That means we give you four playouts. Each playout is on a different quarter of the day, so you know, midnight to 6, 6 to 12, etc. Um, but if you're every two weeks, then we give you three playouts and you know a third of the day. And then if you're once a month, we'll give you two playouts a week. And then you know, but they always have the request to to change up you know what's playing right now, and we'll use that basic schedule if they are not big into communication. Uh, yeah. So I think we have time for one more question. I'd like to ask a, program, a question about programs from schools like concerts. And plays and things like that. Um, we have two school districts and one of them has been uh, reluctant to videotape and of course allow us to play uh, school plays and concerts, not because they are afraid of audience draw away from their live event, but for because they don't have a license to do it because mm -hmm. they sign some agreement saying they're not allowed to do that. Have you had any success working with schools that maybe for a nominal fee they get permission to record it and play it back on, on a public access channel for X number of times? Uh, we, yeah, we've definitely covered school events and things of that nature that have um, some sort of copyright part. Music is a, is a big one, if they can clear the rights. I'll say I'm probably not the best person at my, at my company to, to answer that question because I don't, I don't know making those deals or anything like that, uh, but we typically, are encouraging them to pick things that they can clear and know that they can before they maybe even come to us with covering it, um, as we would, we'd love to get it. You know, we, we cover uh, youth uh, orchestra concerts and they have like four big concerts a year and those are some of our most watched programs. People love them, um, but 
sometimes they do songs that they cannot clear and we have to cut them out of our ultimate program and it shortens it <laughs> and that's not ideal um, I, I, I think I could put you in contact with somebody who could answer that better though yeah, if right. you want so technically that's the end of the panel if you guys want to keep talking with uh, with folks if you're interested to keep talking because sure. it sounds like there's more questions uh, Tim, is it really, I, thought, I thought this ends at 3.30 it was three, and then I was told that schedule was wrong, so I had it scheduled 145 to three. That was in the. Okay. And that's a lunch of being special for opinion. Okay. Um, yeah, not telling us anything. Right. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. That's why I won't sit in two. That's right. So we have some more time. Um, I, just, I realized. I realize because I have someone showing up here for me at three o'clock. So I, that's why, I, um, let me do two things. Um, feel free to continue to have this conversation. I may run out and run back. I think you guys can handle it, your programmers. Um, I want to make sure that um, one thing I want to add is what I was intrigued by in looking at both of the content made by both of these programmers. Um, is they also their ability to sort of connect with other groups. Um, you know, Patrick made a really cool cat video because you can't get enough cat videos. But the idea is that he partnered with the Humane Society. And so you could look at your, the Animal Rescue League, the Humane Society organizations, and say to them, hey, have a contest. We're going to judge the you know, best cat video. Now you have an organization of hundreds or thousands of folks who can get an email blast and they're going to produce content and send it your way. Um, Kate had a, a production done in conjunction with an environmental uh, forestry group. You know, you're able to go out to an environmental group and say, you know, oh, your your members are. I'll, I'll use it a, a reference point for me. Um, they're potentially trying to build a new landfill a hundred, two hundred feet next to a state park and a lake in New Hampshire. Um, it's like, okay, so you're all up in arms about that. Go out and make a community-oriented video about you know, recycling, redemption, waste management, and that association, again, can email blast their members and say, we're partnering with the channel, make a video and sh send it to them, here's some of their guidelines. So they're both smart in engaging other nonprofits to generate content for them, because the task is daunting, it's, it's time consuming, it's, you know, uh, multiple legs that you have to, of, of channels that you have to create um, so was there another question so if you could ask your question I'm gonna go run and see if my person who's supposed to meet me here I have to tell them I'm still working
Definitely. Um, Rob is going to wrap my panel because I think my person is here. Um, I apologize for this. Entirely my fault. So you get to pay the piper. No. Do you ever recut any of your longer programs for social media? For social media, uh, yeah. we, we'll take some like excerpts to, to promote it. Oh. Um, usually, sharing. Can we have a quiet, please, guys? <laughs> Karen. Shh. We we have a we have a marketing person who would who would help. Sometimes they help in delivering the materials to do that. You know, because I'm the one moving the files around. Uh, but we'll we'll have like Instagram where there's limits on how long your clip can be or whatever. I, I can assist in in pulling something, but they're ultimately this other person is ultimately putting you it together. Uh, I I don't have too much to do with the social media distribution that's outside of just general like live streams are happening. I, I help usually on campaigns and my marketing by info by. I'm the one that knows what content we have, right? <laughs> so I'm usually helping craft things, and then I hand it off, and our marketing person runs with it past and, that. And those fun newscasts that you, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're in English? Yes, the ones that we're pulling are in English, yes. Um, but those, those typically have a very broad, you know, international news, so they could be appeal to anybody. Uh, we take Deutsche Welle, and they do like six different programs that we pull every single week. And they have a different focus. So one's about always about like exercise, and like that's universal, right? Um, and other ones are very much like what's going on in Europe. Sure, we don't live in Europe, but that affects everyone. <laughs> that's a pretty big place, right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, I started doing something this year that I've never done before. Uh, we had a particularly evergreen show. And so I sent out unsolicited pitches to other stations, like, hey, do you want to license this show? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm curious, as other programmers, like, was, would that type of thing be well received? Like, it works. We got a lot of licenses on it. Um, and I love seeing that. But just anecdotally, like, if you got an email like that, would you be like, nice? Or would you be like, got my own fish to fry? Hmm. I might need to think on that one if you have anything uh, coming to mind. Yeah, so usually, so I'll, I'll start in a different, from the other side of it, and then I'll answer a question, which is when we have producers who want to get their show out there, we always tell them, if you wanted to get it, if you want to get it played in another community where they don't get our channel, the best way to do it is to get somebody you know who lives there to petition your center to play it. Um, and the reason behind that is that I'm much more receptive to people in my own community trying to give me content, uh, especially if, you know, like yours is a center or something, and it's not like an international media outlet or whatever. Um, I'm going to be more receptive if somebody in my community is like, hey, this is something great, and I want it to play on our channel. I want, I want to see it as well as me and my friends in a community. I think it's really beneficial to us. Uh, so if somebody does that, then I always investigate it. I'll always check it out and try to try to track it down. How if would I'm, you find it if it originated on another public access station outside of there? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. I guess... Uh, their friend is the producer. Th their friend is the producer. Well, that can often be, oh, be a thing. Um, yeah. This is a video like your center is making, like it's an enhanced production. Um, so I think typically for that, you know, I had a whole slide about like VMX, and that's the way I am typically expecting to see those programs. And because it's built in, it's also like super easy to, to grab it. If you were telling other centers like, hey, this thing is here, and we already have an infrastructure to get it, we will be receptive to that too. Um, will be? I, yes, okay, I think yeah, so. the emails were like, hey, here's the show that will be on VMX tomorrow. Oh yeah. Breakdown of what it is. We think it'd be appropriate evergreen content. Yeah, if you're on the uh, Van Slack channel, we have like the, yeah. people are doing that all the time. I look at those. I look at those. I check them out and see if it's appropriate, or send it to somebody who might be interested in it. Um, those things I like because it's an apparatus apparatus that I'm already familiar with that I can very easily go and go. Oh, I heard about that. I heard it was good. I'll I'll check it out. I'll review it. See if it's appropriate for my channel. Um, the thing that I'm less receptive to is sort of very out of the blue things that are not local at all. I mean, right. Vermont is California. is close by. Yeah, you hear from California, and it's like I got this wrestling show, and you're like, 
so <laughs> like, <laughs> like, and you don't know if it's gonna be any good, and you don't know if like, well, I don't know if that's like the thing that they love here. Um, it doesn't have too much to do with my community, but if you know somebody here who's all about it and thinks it's beneficial to us, then I, they're more receptive. Um, and I actually, a lot of the things that I hear about are typically um, through the radio side. We get a lot of things where it's some band who has nothing to do with us sending us some sampler. And we're like, oh, should we spend the time? If we have time, like, should we spend it to, to like, review all these tracks? Or are we going to use the things that we already have access to that have a very straightforward licensing process? Every time you add a new avenue that you're getting your content, it's going to create a little bit of work. And some are much more structured than others. Having somebody just email you a link isn't always as good as like, hey, I've got a Dropbox set up, and they're always delivered Monday at 10. That's where I'm more interested in that partnership than here's a random link or, or anything like that. Um, and that's also something that's replenishing, right? That's a big benefit to being a programmer. If you can find an avenue that keeps generating new content, that's great. If it's like, I got, I got one file, and I'm going to send you another file in three years, because I have another thing, <laughs> I'm going to be like, oh, it's, it's the, the amount of time for me to get this one thing. I could be downloading 10 things on VMX. <laughs> like, uh, but, but for people already in your network you know are interested, sending out those notes, I think, is helpful. Kate, did you have an answer? Yeah, I mean, I would say, actually, once you described, like, the email, like, if I got that in my inbox, I would, like, be pretty interested, and I would, like, I don't download things off of VMX myself, but someone I work with does, so I would, like, forward it to him, be like, could you please grab this for me? Um, but I would also agree with what you said, sort of, uh, if it's something in the workflow that's, like, that ensures that my eyes are on it, whereas, like, uh, kind of, like, uh, uh, email like that, I would I would look at it and be interested, but it would be because it's not in the workflow. It may uh, not catch my attention as much in a way, not not catch my attention, but it would be it would more easily fall out of my brain, you know. Um, yeah, so just reiterate. I would also say um, the way that you craft that email helps a lot because I get yeah. some that are <laughs> like this is spam, yeah. and I don't respond, and some are are still spam but they put my name in it and they said yeah. like hey, I was checking out what you're doing in Burlington Vermont this seems like it might help like you're be interesting to you and I'll be like if I I'm like hey I'll write back try to get a sponsor and then I never hear back from them and I'm like yeah I know what this email was but I'm at least going to give that if it's like hey person who works here like and it's just <laughs> very spammy I'll be like this isn't even worth my time I got too many other things to do through line of all this is professional courtesy that helps a lot. The ease of getting it, the yeah, progression, yeah, you got it. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? So I don't, I jump in for Tim, and I don't know what you guys have been discussing, but one of the things I found in Beverly was that some of the younger people, and you look very much younger than me, so uh, when I got there, my content manager was like, nobody watches the channel, why do I even care? And I'm like, why are you running this content? How do you guys feel about, I mean, I, was, I said basically, you know, if I would, at my age, if you told me that I got to schedule a TV channel, I would have been like, wow, well, let's do it. Do you guys ever find that there are people that are in your age that are like, the, the channel's not worth it, or that you really focus on distribution through other methods, or do you guys love scheduling a TV channel? I love channel, uh, scheduling a TV Oh my gosh, sorry, I'm chewing on my words really bad. I love scheduling a TV channel, uh, a few of them. I really enjoy it. Um, you know, it might not be directly answering your question, but something I think about is sort of, uh, you know, when you think about the old days of like maybe more, more West Coast based public access where you have like the call in shows, lots of uh, audience interaction. I actually think that young people, if they knew that there is like the potential for that through our stations and stuff, I think that people would be so, so into it. Um, I myself am trying to think of a good way of getting people into it because it is like a little bit of a hard sell. Cable's a little bit of a hard sell these days, but uh, those things can still be done through YouTube and other means. Um, it's really just kind of a matter of marketing ourselves as being able to do that. But I do think that, 
you know, actually during uh, last year we had like local elections going on and there was one race where there was like maybe like three or four college students come, calling in during like this 30 minute forum, um, which was, I hadn't seen anything like that while I'd been working there and that was a really cool thing to see. There definitely is like the passion and interest. It's kind of about the avenue. Uh, I think most of those people were watching through YouTube, not through our channels. Um, but I do think, you know, <laughs> I don't know if it could be a way to get young people back into cable, but I do think that the format that was built could be really interesting to young people if it was marketed towards them. I think, you know, I hear people who come through like, oh, it's going to be on TV, and they're like, when is it going to be online? Um, that <laughs> seems to be more of a draw. But if I'm thinking more as like a programmer, you know, being, ha having the tentacles wrap around the the, the community, something in that that's nice. But really, it's it's ultimately part of it's you know, like this is a work and job, and you got to just do it. Um, but there's an art to it. There's actually an art to to doing it, and you pick it up over time. Um, I come from more of a curation background because I, I was like I was working in museums and historic sites and stuff, and that was what I kind of was studying. And that's how I ended up getting into this. Is that it was. A job posting about like programming stuff, and I was like, "Oh, well, that's kind of, it's a transferable skill." And then I ended up getting all into the TV world, um, and I see the art in it. And I sometimes will watch other channels and go, oh, "What are they doing?" <laughs> it's like they don't care. So you have to you have to care. You have to because you believe in the mission of whatever your center has as their mission, um, but then also just the craft. It's a craft, um, and. When I have the time, I'll really dedicate and try to make it a nice, appealing block. And even if the people aren't watching it uh, as much as other channels, I know that I, I did a good job and it, it looks good and it's professional and I'm trying as much as I can to shake off some of the stigma of public access TV and like we're delivering a nice, solid product in how it's, how it's presented. Um, Another question that I've, I've um struggled with is that as, as we move into the world of shorter form, you know, uh, content that's, you know, five minutes long, um, does, is there a place for that on the channel? You know, uh, yes. how, where does the place, is it just filler in between the longer content? Um, yeah, well, I think, you know, if it's, again, if you're like making a block where everything is like sort of connected by a thread, right? Um, I think something shorter can absolutely like, you know, even be like a good bridge in between two longer programs. Uh, depending on what it is, really. Um, so I don't. I know that not a lot of stations do this. The way how I schedule uh, is, I sort of schedule by like pretty numbers. Like I don't really do things back to back. I'll schedule something at you know 5 p.m. Then if there's like if it ends at like 5:12, I'll schedule something for 5:20 instead. So I think like using that, it does kind of um, you know. Sometimes if you want something to like really be pretty and have one you know, chunk of content end at like 5.30 and then you, you get to stretch it out a little bit with that. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that those have a place um, on our channels, in our archives, stuff like that. Um, they can act as good, you know, we don't do commercials, but sort of, you know, you can treat them as commercials in a way. Yeah. Um, or, you know, we all have bulletin boards too, add them to your bulletin boards, they're, they're good. Yeah, so I actually had a note about this and I didn't bring it up, but in terms of like, the younger people coming through our studio, a trend I've noticed is they're giving us short content in a way that if I look in the archive, I'm like, we never got things over five minutes. We're getting more and more stuff, and I, I don't know what that says about people, but <laughs> well, it seems there like is a, a there is a transition to a shorter attention span. Yeah, it, it, your, it's, your media consumption. I think the way that people are thinking about media and making things that they're pushing out there, I've, I've seen a lot more short form content, um, and it does have a place on the channel because, you know, filler. Is something that is difficult to do, um, and then I, I mentioned earlier that we have like, we have a block that is featuring short form content. This by the slice that we can plug in any time if we need to. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if you've experienced this, but I feel like the average length of program we get for like you know like a feature length kind of thing is like an hour and six minutes, which is like the worst thing to ever get. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> and I feel like half of the programs we have are like an hour and six minutes. They're like, great, this is 32 minutes. Uh, um, nothing's ever 28 minutes or 58 minutes or exactly two hours. It's always, and then people will submit an episode. It's like episode one was an hour and 50 minutes. Episode two is eight minutes. <laughs> you're like, okay. <laughs> You're like, okay, great, great, thanks. Um, 
<laughs> so having short content is great, because I've noticed just in my server, we have tons that are like an hour and six minutes or 12 minutes or whatever. Um, then we have giant gaps. And we've got a lot that's like around three minutes. And then we have a lot that's around seven. And then we don't have anything until we get to like 20. And there's a place. We want the short content. Yeah, and I mean, that's we what it, people are making short content. That's what they're often interested. I mean, I had the city of Beverly. It was like, we want to, your help in producing stuff about focusing on particular city departments, but it's going to be distributed on our social media. Oh, yeah. So I said, it's well, so I can... It's for the internet, right? Yeah. Well, and I was like, I sat there and I, uh, I edited in portrait mode for the first time in my life. I never knew that I would do that. And I'm like, here I am. I never thought I'd be ed editing in portrait. And then we had to find something to put it on the channel to make it wider and stuff like that. Jim? Yeah, we have a prize drawing about five minutes in the Okay. Well, thank you guys for the you know for the help and give a little uh, little love for the work that these guys did in preparing the uh, workshop. Thank you guys. Yeah.